So, um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk to you today about applied RL and more specifically how to apply one of the armed bandits. Um, and yeah, um, yeah, Nick uh, gave an intro so um, about my profile, so I'm gonna skip the boring part. Um, so yeah, we we all know you know this uh, fun stuff that you can do with RL that you know you can play games uh, like Pac-Man and all this stuff. Um, and probably most of you have already, you know, heard or played with, you know, DQN, um, or, you know, uh, this poor guy was defeated by, uh, you know, AlphaGo um, some years ago, and, um, you know, it was powered, you know, the algorithm was powered by reinforcement learning. Um, and, you know, reinforcement learning, you know, is a part of AI, and um, it's different from supervised learning, where, you know, you give label data and you train a model. Um, uh, where you, the algorithm learns by trial and error. So there is some um, exploration and exploitation uh, dilemma going on uh, of, you know, if I'm playing chess, uh, should I continue doing the same moves or should I try something new and then something completely new and potentially, uh, you know, win the game? Um, so there is a rewarding mechanism there. Um, and so um, the key concepts in RL is that you have a state, an action, and a reward. And um, given the state, the algorithm will uh, make some decision, will take some action. And you see that there is a dotted line between action and reward, because usually the reward is very sparse. If you're playing chess or go, uh, uh, the reward of you winning the game um, it, it's going to be delayed. Um, and that makes it quite um, hard to be used in um, real world applications uh, in e-commerce. And something that works and I've seen, be, you know, I've seen working uh, is multi bandits where essentially you, you can relax some um, of, of the stuff that you've seen before. So you can have context-free multi-arm bandits. I'm gonna talk about contextual ones later. So suppose that you don't have any state, um, you still have the environment and um, you have a rewarding mechanism and you can take some actions or arms. Uh, you, this term is usually um, um, used in uh, multi-arm bandits. And why bandit? I mean, uh, this whole thing was inspired by slot machines. And let's say that you're a gambler. And let's say that you have also an infinite uh, amount of money. And someone told you that, you know, one of these slot machines has um, uh, the highest expected uh, probability to win money. So what you're doing is that, you know, you don't know which one it, is it. So, you know, the first thing that comes to your mind is, you know, I'm gonna dedicate some time on the first slot machine and see how many times I won something, how many times I lost. Then I'll go to the next slot machine and then the third and the fourth, etc. Obviously this greedy approach uh, doesn't lead to, to a really good solution. Um, it's just an approximate solution. And you get a reward here, you see that it's immediate. So uh, the other thing that I forgot to mention is that uh, you see that the line between action and reward is not dotted. Uh, so that means that, you know, uh, we, we have the assumption that the reward is immediate after you, you choose an action or an arm. Um, and guess what? Uh, you know, the same thing can be used on selecting the best, you know, hero image on your homepage. For example, I chose Amazon here because I think most of you are familiar with, with the concept. Um, you see here, um, the chosen one says, simplify your TV experience, fire TV stick, etc." But this, this is also a carousel, so it has more options. And how do you choose which one should be uh, the winner, should be used most of the times? Um, you don't have any training data. Um, this candidate said can change on every month or two months. Um, and um, then how do you define, you know, what's the best one? Potentially your reward here can be any 
progress to uh, progress to any page. Uh, with, the, with a hypothesis that if you have something that um, is appealing to most people, will make them click on things. On things. Um, another example is that let's say that you know I searched for um, t-shirts for men here, uh, and we see four results um, um, in the results. Um, so as, as someone that uh, wants to sell search and appears on these results, how do you choose which image should be shown on the results? Essentially, which image should be shown here that will increase the probability that you're gonna click on an item, on a, on a, on a product here. Um, and if you go uh, to, uh, I'm gonna switch now. If you go here and I click on this product, you'll see that uh, this product has many different images. And essentially every product can be assigned with a, can be assigned with a multi-arm bandit model uh, that essentially the arms are the different kind of images and the reward is uh, the click-through rate. Um, and I've seen that working really well. Um, and there are many other um, applications uh, for example, let's say that you are Netflix and um, there are today 200 trending movies. Um, so how are you going to show the top 10? You don't want to show 200 movies to your users, but you can use multi arm bandits here. And what you can say is that my pool of trending movies is 200. So I have 200 arms or actions and the reward is click on any of the top 10 trending uh, movies, for example. Um, and then select the best email subject line. This is very, it's a classic one. Um, I, I've been to meetings where people were discussing and saying, oh, we should use this subject line. I think it's better on the other one, on the third one, etc." cetera. Um, sometimes uh, the person that is, uh, you know, that has the fattest salary will decide which one will be chosen. Uh, but if we want to be truly data driven, what we can say is that we have some experts that say that will generate these uh, different subject lines, let's say 10 or 20, that align with you know, companies' um, values. And then we can let the bandit do the last mile optimization. Essentially, the, choose the subject line that will increase the uh, open email rate. And that's the reward. Another one, uh, it's to select the frequency of notifications after a user has viewed the product. Let's say that I was on the Amazon app, um, I checked uh, a product, um, and then for some other reason, um, I, I haven't purchased it. So what you can say is that, okay, um, I want, as a, as a marketer, I want to send a notification to this person to remind them that uh, this product is still available and is still on sale, let's say. Um, so the question is, should I send that after 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 300 minutes later? Uh, so these different frequencies can be the arms and the reward can be click on notification. Um, and um, something that, uh, by the way, I think that John Langford is the father of contextual bandits. Uh, he, he works for Microsoft and he is one of the uh, uh, biggest uh, contributors to Vopal Wabit. Um, and he, he says that you have an RL problem and the data that you want to learn on is created by the solution. So that's, uh, that's what I always use as a, as a true north to decide if something is conceived, can be solved with uh, bandits or not. Um, there are many videos from John Langford that says that the traditional RL doesn't work in practice in e-commerce. Uh, use cases. Uh, he's a big fan of contextual bandits. Um, so let's let's move on the map definition. Um, what we want to achieve in this um, in the classic map problem is that we have k arms, so k different um, images, uh, candidate images for the home page, for example, and t rounds. Uh, we assume that. Uh, we have a specific 
um, time frame to define the arm that has the highest reward. So essentially in each round, an algorithm picks an arm and then the in the environment, um, we get feedback from the environment, i.e. reward. Uh, we assume that the reward is binary here for the chosen arm and then the algorithm learns through this process. Uh, and what you want to achieve is to essentially minimize regret uh, or maximize reward. These things are uh, essentially the same thing. Um, and regret means that um, if, if there was an Oracle algorithm that for some reason knew the actual uh, reward rates for its arm, uh, this algorithm will always choose the best arm, right? So the regret for this algorithm will be zero. Uh, so all the other algorithms will have a regret that is non-zero. So the goal is to find the algorithm that will have the minimum regret. And that essentially translates into max reward. So um, a classic um, algorithm is the beta Thompson something. Um, it's a, essentially a Bayesian algorithm uh, where you want to maximize the cumulative reward. Um, and you update the posterior uh, of each arm uh, from the rewards that uh, it receives from the environment. Um, I'm, I'm not going to spend time a lot in theory. I'm just doing a, a quick summary. Assume that either you know or you can read papers or articles out there that uh, probably explain things um, much better than I do. Um, but the idea is that essentially every arm is um, is assigned a beta distribution. And um, essentially the algorithm um, draws um, a value from these beta distributions and uh, selects the arm with the highest uh, theta. So theta is the, the, the number that is drew, uh, that it, it's drew, it was drawn from the beta distribution. So essentially every arm um, at the beginning can look something like that. The beta distributions can look something like that. Um, I assume uh, I gave as a, you know, as a prior uh, to the beta distributions, the parameters of A and B to be equal to one. Uh, this is debatable. I've seen people uh, chosen uh, alpha and beta to be dot one, uh, but yeah, we can argue about that, you know, for hours. And then let's say that, you know, some arm, let's say arm two, the slot machine two, or the hero image, uh, can the hero image two, or the um, subject line uh, two, had uh, 20 rewards and 10, uh, 20 positive rewards and 10 negative rewards. So essentially then the distribution for this arm would look, will look like that. And every time you draw a number from this distribution and, uh, and you make uh, decisions. And ultimately at the, at the end of a specific um, period, uh, you want the distributions to look like that. So to be very narrow, uh, essentially to have you know, low variance uh, in order to, to say that you know, my arms have converged, the algorithm has converged, and then you can compare all these different beta distributions and you can say, okay, um, arm four is the best one uh, because it's on the most right-hand side uh, if, you, if you put them all together there. Um, so let's go and, you know, in the real world, let's say we're in a co you know, company and we managed to sell this idea to our manager and the manager to the, to the VP, et cetera. And uh, they say, okay, you have three weeks to, to build a POC and uh, prove that this thing works. So no pressure. Um, so first thing that you need to do with your product manager uh, is to decide, okay, what's the definition of the best uh, arm, of the best hero image? So we agree it's the one that increases the probability of a user progressing to any next phase. So we want people to progress to any next phase uh, because the assumption, the hypothesis that we make is that this here image that is on top will make the website more appealing, more attractive, uh, more relevant, you name it, and makes people to, 
you search more on the homepage, scroll down, eventually click on something. Um, what are the arms, the candidate images? So who is going to create all these candidate images? Um, this is a true story. Uh, companies still there generate, they have a product team or a content team that generates hundreds of candidate images for products, for home, or for home page, landing pages, etc. And um, the problem is that they have so many that they cannot run a traditional A-B test. Uh, because it will take probably years, even if you have the traffic of Amazon to, to reach a statistically significant result. Um, so usually it's chosen in a qualitative way, but they're equally all really good. Um, I mean, aesthetically. So um, let's assume that the product team has created these candidate images. And that's the best thing to do to get them involved this one um, and tell them that all of them to be considered as candidates, they should be aesthetically nice, they should meet the minimum criteria that the company uh, has. Okay, how the hell we're gonna um, integrate that with the front end? So classic problem with data scientists, okay, I have something, I have simulation locally, Okay, and then you know people tell you, okay, I want this to be running in production. So um, one solution that could work is to have the sampling logic, where essentially you make um, a recommendation and you say that at this specific uh, time step, you should do this specific user, you should show uh, this here image. Uh, can be done through a RESTful service, and you can have an endpoint that would look like like this post sample. Um, and then, okay, so essentially the front end before they render the uh, homepage, they would call our service to uh, get a recommendation from uh, our bandit, which image to show. Obviously it should be super fast. Um, and um, yeah, I've been to situations where the 95th percentile response time for this one was 50 milliseconds. So uh, you need to be careful because if, if it's slow, then it doesn't matter. The user experience is really bad. Okay, how the front end will provide feedback. So um, the front end can post only positive feedback if you think about this. They can say that I showed image 20 and the person, the user at the time, uh, progressed to some next page. Um, and then at that point, the front end asynchronously can send this feedback, feedback class um, and we can update the model. But the negative feedback um, cannot be sent because if someone views uh, a, a, a hero image on the homepage and they don't like it, and they don't like the, the, the website, they will bounce. And you, you cannot capture that. It's, it's almost impossible. It's really hard. So what you can do is essentially you can uh, define some uh, kind of timeout. And you can say that, you know, if I don't receive any positive feedback in 30 minutes uh, for this specific image, I assume that it was a bad choice uh, for the user. Um, and uh, before I go to the next step, um, how you, define this timeout. Um, so what you can do is that you can do some um, explor exploratory uh, data analysis on the log data of your homepage. And you can see um, in user sessions, uh, measure what's the time uh, in seconds or milliseconds between the time that someone lands on the homepage and the time that they go to the next page. And what you can say, okay, I'm gonna calculate the 90th percentile or the 95th percentile of that. And we can say, okay, the 95th percentile of somebody landing on the homepage and then moving on another page is 15 minutes. So then you can set the timeout 15 minutes because you assume that the last 5% are yeah, out, it's, it's outliers. Okay, so the most difficult question is that, okay, how are you going 
you can prove that it works because in e-commerce, uh, people use A-B test platforms and they, they, they use uh, KPIs uh, there to say if a specific feature or algorithm or whatever um, increases click through rate, conversion, money, you name it. But how are you gonna prove that here? Um, so what you're gonna do is that you're gonna still run an A-B test, but in the control, you have the current status quo. So the current static hero image that is selected by the product team. In the treatment group, you're using the bandit service. Um, but essentially um, has a pool of, let's say, 30 images. Um, and then what you can do is that you can use the A-B test platform and say if the, um, if the bandit um, has operated better than the control in terms of the click through, the click through rate, uh, essentially the, the progression to the next step. So you can measure that. And you, you should read the statistically significant result. And then you are like 95% or 99% sure that it works. Um, and then you can measure other KPIs. You can see that this um, immediate reward that you have of essentially pushing people to the next page and potentially that means pushing people down the funnel, the, the shopping, the shopping funnel, um, it is also increasing um, um, conversions, purchases. And that's really cool because essentially you can prove that you make more people to click. And at the same time, you can say to the senior leadership, uh, okay, I made this amount of money. And then you can get the green light to go and do more cool stuff. Um, so um, architecturally, um, we'll look something like that. Essentially, um, the front end will decide uh, for every user if this user is going to be in control or treatment. Uh, so I make the assumption that you know in your business, you have a mature A-B test platform here. And if the user that lands on the homepage is assigned to the treatment group, that means that the front end is going to call our REST API. And the request body will have the user ID. So I've used the ID UID here. And the user ID can be um, um, either someone has logged in and we have their unique identifier, or if, if they're, you know, they're a new user, uh, you can use the, uh, a cookie or something like that to essentially say that, you know, this potentially is a uh, new user. Um, and then the response of our uh, REST API will look something like that. You, you'll see later why I use the user ID. You'll understand later because you, you tell me you don't use that when you sample from the bit that comes from something, right? Um, and then the response body will look like this, where you say arm ID is image three, and that can be like the URL of image. And you have also decision ID. So this specific uh, sampling action, action is uh, essentially assigned a decision ID in our backend. And you see later why this is important. It's important because then we can link our decisions uh, to the feedback. Essentially, um, the uh, front end, let's say that, you know, image three was really nice for this specific user. So that means that they progress to the next page. So then um, what you do as a front end guy, you're uh, sending us feedback and the feedback should contain the user ID, the arm ID and the decision ID. Uh, and then on the back end, what we do is we say, okay, what was our decision ID? We find the decision ID was IMAT3. Okay, that's good. So that's a double verification that the front end, uh, they don't have a series back there. And also I'm gonna assign a feedback. Uh, I'll, I'll create a new feedback uh, log uh, um, in my log data that will say IMAT3 had the feedback, a positive feedback. And um, essentially then what you're gonna do is uh, you can have some form of scheduled job that essentially um, reads the log data that live in some storage 
Um, I don't use any technologies here. It's up to you to decide that it's conceptual. It has the decisions and the feedbacks. And the scheduled job can be scheduled, uh, uh, the interval can be equal to the timeout uh, time that we have decided when to assign uh, a negative uh, reward. Essentially, what does this mean is that uh, let's call them uh, orphan um, decisions on the decisions and feedback store, they will be assigned a negative uh, feedback immediately. Um, and then the scheduled job will uh, update the model, will update essentially the beta params uh, A and B for each arm and we'll update them on the REST API. Um, and one more thing, um, what about if the user comes back to the homepage after three minutes or refreshes the page? It's gonna be a really bad user experience if, if every time that uh, they refresh the, uh, um, the hero image changes. And, and I've measured that in uh, a test, uh, um, using A-B test um, and uh, the results were really bad. So that's why you, you need the user ID um, or some entity ID uh, where essentially you say, okay, for this user, I have made a decision and it should say, stay in some consistency cast for sp some specific time. Um, so the time is TTL, usually this is how uh, it's called in, uh, in cache -ish. so time to leave. Uh, you can say, okay, this is going to, to leave there for five minutes or 10 minutes. So this usually uh, depends on the use case and um, it's good to ask the product manager uh, because they usually uh, know, they have more domain knowledge about that uh, than you. And um, yeah, then should I implement this beta console sampling myself or not? Um, my my, my uh, line here is that, you know, up to the beta Thompson sampling, you can do it yourself, uh, but don't go further. Uh, try to use uh, open source libraries. And we're really lucky because TF agents, they have um, a dedicated uh, part in their library with uh, contextual bandits, uh, which is really cool. And the reason is that you shouldn't implement it probably yourself is that um, TF agents has 86 contributors, essentially 86 Google employees. Uh, so they're getting paid to do full-time this, uh, whereas probably yourself not going to do that full-time. Uh, so um, their quality of code will be like 9% uh, better than yours. And Vopal Wabbit, that's another cool, um, a tool. Uh, it also supports, as you probably know, supervised algorithms, but it has a, a section for uh, multi arm bandits, contextual multi arm bandits. Uh, it's more mature than TF agents. Um, personally, I prefer it. It's, I think it's a personal um, taste. And it has uh, 128 contributors, and I think the vast majority of them are Microsoft employees. And one of them is um, John Langford. So, um, yeah, I would suggest to use those two when you say, okay, Beta Thompson something works, is amazing. Uh, I've proven to, to the senior leadership that it works. And then they tell you, okay, uh, let's move on and have something contextual. Um, and then, okay, how about adversarial, adversarial bandits uh, like EXP3? So, the, the bandits that the beta Thompson sampling assumes that we live in a stationary environment during this um, uh, time uh, period, the T steps, the number of T steps, uh, it doesn't change, uh, which is not entirely true in some use cases. So let's say if you're booking or Expedia uh, and you have a hero image on the homepage, you have the environment changes. You cannot have a snowy image there for, for 12 months. If you have that, you know, and you land, somebody lands there, yeah, nobody's going to uh, make any booking uh, in normal days before COVID. So, um, um, what about adversarial bandits? They look that, you know, these things can work and they adapt to the environment. They usually convert much, much slower, obviously, because they assume that there's uh, some other party there that tries to trick them. 
But the tricky part is that it's really, really hard to prove to business that they work. Uh, because essentially you have to run a long A-B test for three months or four months while the environment changes. And you can say during this time that, um, yeah, uh, my uh, adversarial bandit works, uh, but you have to let it run for a long time. So I wouldn't go there. Uh, uh, probably something that works. And I talked to, to, some, to some friends that work in big tech companies. They usually reset the bandit with new candidates every week or every month and they run a new one. Um, so yeah, we have like uh, now contextual multi bandits that I talked um, two slides before. So essentially uh, what you want to do is that you can use the string as, as a feature vector to decide what's the best action R uh, and will maximize the reward. So essentially in the here image problem, your context can be the time of the day, um, what type of browser they're using, if it is mobile or desktop, and then you can say, oh, for mobile and on Safari, um, image four is the best one. But for a Safari and desktop, image 15 is the best one. Uh, oh, by the way, um, sometimes you run the context Always is, is, is really, really important to run the context-free bandit first. Uh, I've seen situations where I run a contextual one later and it didn't uh, prove to be better in the AB test uh, readout. Um, and that's, I think most of the cases, the problem is that, you know, we have chosen the wrong um, features um, and it's really tricky to go and find what are the, the, the best state features um, that you should use. Uh, you should then try and do something uh, called off policy evaluation and use the existing log data uh, from previously deployed bandits to try to debias them and then link them with what would have been the state back then and rerun different algorithms. I, I'm not getting into that. Um, it can be like a completely different talk. Um, as I said, the, 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 um, what's the difference with the context uh, uh, free bandits that the contextual ones, um, essentially the state of the environment is a feature vector. They call it um, context, essentially literature that's by contextual uh, bandits. And as I said, yeah, in the previous use case, the context could be if the person is a new user, time of the day, country code, uh, browser type, uh, mobile or desktop, um, et cetera. Uh, there are even advanced settings where the arms themselves can be associated with features. Uh, Vopal Wabbit support these kind of advanced settings, by the way. So, okay, how, like if, if you know, you shouldn't do that, but, uh, it's always a nice exercise. Um, uh, you, in fact, you shouldn't implement a contextual bandit yourself. You should do this exercise. Um, how about if the, um, how are we gonna implement that? So um, we can start thinking aloud how we can implement a contextual bandit and use Thompson sampling at the same time. Um, what I'm going to give you here is not like, a, you know, bulletproof solution um, in purpose. I, I just uh, did it in a, um, a rough way. And uh, what you can do is that you can assume that every arm can be associated with some function um, um, that is essentially um, a regression function. And here, okay, I have one feature uh, and um, you have also the, um, the beta zero and you can debate, debate if this should be added or not in bandits. I personally wouldn't add this bias uh, in the first place. Uh, but then what you assume, that what you can do is you can say is that uh, every weight of the feature is, um, are distributed as independent Gaussians. And then um, you can say that, uh, 
you express your reward as the probability of reward for its arm to be of this form right now. And that gives you the ability because every time that you make during the sampling logic, every time that you make a sampling logic, you sample from these independent Gaussian distributions for its weight. Then you form your function. Then you run, run it through the features that you have. And then uh, you get this, the uh, value and then finally uh, you get the, uh, the probability. And that means that you can use a Thomson sampling logic on top of that. Um, and then you can read this paper and see how you can update these weights. Um, uh, Chappelle has a you know, really nice proof about that. Um, and um, essentially it's, you can use directly the, the, the equations to, that he has proved to update your model, or you can use an open source library. And then what will change uh, in your deploy, deployed model now that you move to contextual bandits. Um, yeah, first of all, you're gonna use uh, an open source library, if agents or VW. Um, your background schedule job um, um, will be responsible still to get the log data from the log store and incrementally train a contextual bandit and update it on the REST API. So the, the background job doesn't now send anymore the A and beta, uh, the alpha and beta uh, parameters to the um, REST API, but you can send a serialized model directly. Uh, and now the front end during the sampling phase um, is, uh, is responsible to push the context features to the endpoint. Um, and here's some really cool papers. Essentially they are, I think the vast majority of them are uh, applied. I mean, uh, the first one is from Duolingo, the second one for Booking, the third one is Yahoo, um, the last one is from Amazon. Uh, so they essentially deployed these solutions uh, to production and they, they're proven to be uh, really successful. I think the last one from Amazon, they claim that they increased the conversion by 17%, uh, something crazy. I don't want to, to do the rough calculations of you know, how much money means to them. And uh, some other resources is that uh, TF Agents has a really cool uh, tutorial for bandits. Same for Volvo Wabbit. And something that I really like, uh, um, Azure has a SaaS service, essentially for contextual bandits and context-free bandits. Uh, essentially John Langford uh, uses uh, the Vopal Wabi behind the scenes on this one, as he is a Microsoft employee. And um, I've, I've, been some, I've done some POCs and it's really cool because they give you some extra tooling, some dashboarding, how the arms perform, uh, if, you know, if you get the logs correctly and all this stuff. Uh, because don't forget, at some point, uh, you need lots of engineering work to to continue doing that. And you know, I'm currently leading the um, reinforcement learning team at Expedia Group. And I, I can tell you that um, we, we have software engineers in the team, but also the data scientists should have really strong engineering skills uh, because it's, uh, yeah, it's challenging from from engineering perspective as well. Um, and other cool applications of maps. Uh, I've done some POCs to debias existing ML models. So essentially what you can do there is that um, um, you can take existing classifiers and during production, you can use the map framework to uh, try and explore a little bit uh, during the decision-making and debias your uh, training data because usually you get into this loop where you use training data that is generated from your previous model, essentially you don't make any progress. And I would highly suggest to, to watch this uh, uh, YouTube video from a Stripe guy who uh, explains how he, they debias um, the, the training data for the uh, fraud detection algorithm. And the same thing for a search engine for a ranking mode, excuse me, ranking model. Uh, from a paper that is jointly written by Microsoft and Facebook. 
Uh, and that's all, folks. Uh, thank you. Cool. That was uh, super, Pavlos. Uh, I like uh, the handy tips you give every time uh, and the depth you cover the topic. Um, I have some questions, but I don't want to start. Is anyone else um, with a question you can ask? I mean, I incentivize that you open the mic and ask, but if you don't want to do that, you can also ask in the chat. No worries, I say. Um, I can kick off um, with one question. Uh, Pablo, I'm trying to understand the difference with um, supervised learning. Um, I think to a certain extent, you gave us the answer uh, in A-B testing, right? So I think for A-B testing, uh, it makes sense that at times you might have a lot of options. Possibly with supervised learning, the problem could be the same, I guess, that you know you don't have the data when you start sort of wanting to create the model and maybe multi-arm bandwidth gets you into the solution quicker. But um, yes, what is the difference with, uh, if you can offer some comments on this and then also, how applicable is it in the case where some of these restrictions don't apply? For example, the example you showed us first uh, had only six images, right? So choosing among those is not, and also probably these are static images or so some seller uh, uploaded them. So you can get data on them and do a supervised model. So how does it compare this technique compared to a situation where you can also do something else? Um, so yeah, first part of the question. Um, so the, I think the difference is that in, in supervised learning, you you have some ground truth. So you have some 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 label data, some features to these uh, labels, and you assume that you know you have a really good representation of the world. This is a really good sample, and then you say, okay, I can train a model there. In the contextual multi-arm bandits, because I think that's more uh, thing kind of related, uh, you still have some features, but you don't have the labels. You don't know for which feature, what should be uh, feature uh, values, which is the best image, right? So you can say this is like a multi-class uh, uh, problem, multi-class classification problem. Uh, and essentially what you're doing is that um, in the a rough example that I show, showed you about the um, linear Thomson sampling, at the end, you use the Thompson sampling methodology to explore and essentially improve your tra your training data, essentially, uh, during production with exploration and exploitation, and ultimately lead, lead you to, um, to the right model. Um, so you don't have the answer. You don't know what's the best, essentially, class if you want to, to make it, you know, relate to be uh, related to supervised learning. You don't know what's the what's the right class for your feature values. Um, and um, the last, uh, the, the other part of your question about, uh, you, you said that, you know, let's say that you, you have, you sell a product on Amazon and you upload the images. Um, I mean, still you cannot build the supervised model there because you have to say to the seller, what you want, what essentially, if you want to build the supervised model there or in, or in the homepage use case, you have to tell the business, okay, we're gonna randomly choose images for a month. We're gonna grab uh, feedback and then I'm gonna build a model. You know what's the answer? No, because, and that's a good answer because it's very risky uh, because many of these images may perform really bad. And if you equally split the traffic, uh, you have a high risk for the business and that's, that's the, the nice part of, about the bandits because quickly eliminate bad actions, bad arms. Okay, very interesting. Um, any other questions? I'm very keen to hear other uh, perspectives on this. Um, 
very happy to keep hammering you with questions, of course. Yeah. I think they watch the game. <laughs> yes, everyone is in two screens, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> you definitely answer another question I've written, which is, you know, what libraries to use, right? You cover that. Uh, I was like, okay, I'm pretty sure there is a library. So that was nice to see. Okay, another question I had was, um, I mean, essentially a follow up on the previous one, right? So essentially what I meant was, say that we have a way to sample, I mean, the, what you said or A-B test, right? Like we either randomly assign images, I'm not saying that the business will select that, but uh, you know, just for, it, um, for the theoretical conversation, let's say we randomly sample or A-B test and collect data on um, which images perform best. Can we compare uh, the multi-arm bandit um, solution to which one performs better to a supervised model? Um, and would, one, would both perform the same? And uh, adjacent to this question is, is one going to perform at a certain level of accuracy quicker? So for example, multi-arm bandwidth, do they require less data for the same performance than a supervised technique or the other way around? Is there, is there any discussion on that somewhere in the okay. paper? Uh, so just to clarify the question. So you mean that, let's say that for some reason we have a classic supervised model, right, for a, for a problem. Um, or let's say we collect data. I mean, we have a way to collect data, data. Uh, data so that we can compare. So theoretically, the supervised models would perform better in the AB. You'll see better um, result on the A-B test readout after you run the A-B test because you already choose the best actions. Whereas the bandit essentially for some time, it will make some suboptimal decisions because it learns uh, and that will affect the readout. And um, as, as a follow up there is that, let's say that we don't do that and we have like the static here image and we have the multi arm bandit in the AB test. Uh, what is usually a really good um, practice is that you run the first AB test. Uh, you may see that the bandit uh, the treatment may not have necessarily the best performance because I've seen cases where the um, exploration time had to be lengthy and that had a cost to the customers, but it wasn't so bad. So there was a story where essentially what we was happening is that uh, somebody from an A-B test uh, platform, I mailed me some point and said, what are you doing in this A-B test? The, you know, the search results click to rate is terrible in your treatment, just shut it down. Um, and then you have to, you know, take a deep breath, breath and you can say, okay, you know, you have to analyze the bandits, what they're doing and essentially see how the weights, because it was a contextual one, how the weights these independent Gaussians behave and you, I was seeing that they were getting narrower and narrower. And I said, you know, give me like, you know, one more week. Um, and you have to explain that. Um, and uh, then what you do is that you turn off the A-B test uh, at some point when it's statistically significant. And what you do is that you take the, you, you run a follow-up A-B test with a static best solutions, with static best arms where you say for this context, that was the best arm, for the other context, the other arm. And then essentially the, your treatment always chooses the best um, options. And this is where you see the true effect on your business. Super. I feel we can talk forever. Anyone else wants to? Jump in. Just, just one before I go, I, 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 I almost went away. But uh, one, one question: uh, Do you know, Pablo, whether um, other companies so use this approach in in production and in, in, uh, in what other ways? I don't know. Maybe I, I've missed I've missed some of the the talk at some point. So I was wondering how um, how usual is this approach instead of more uh, uh, kind of supervised techniques? Let's say. I think it's kind of new. Um, so at Expedia we use it, Booking use this technique, Amazon, Netflix a lot, Microsoft. 
uh, Facebook a lot, I think, for their advertising uh, system. Um, I think the big tech companies use these techniques a lot, um, but that mean, that's because they have lots of traffic, right? So if you want to use the bandwidth, you have to have traffic to, to make it convert. If you have, uh, I don't know, 30 users per day, this thing will never convert. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's kind, I think it's kind of new. That's why TF Agents uh, library is very new in Bandits. The only one that existed before that was Vopal Wabit because of Langford. Um, I think we'll see more and more um, um, use cases, applicable use cases in the future. Uh, so yeah. Cool. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Any other burning questions? Pablo, my last question for you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I say I don't have any other, that's all, everything. Um, in regards to contextualized bandits, even for the non-contextualized one, but maybe more so for, are there any people uh, or efforts that use uh, more complicated models than uh, Gaussian or beta distributions that you said? So maybe a neural net or some sort of machine learning model that estimates the parameters from all this sampling that uh, is going on? Yeah, um, I think the TF agent has this implementation. You can use a neural network, essentially. And uh, what, what it does for exploration, so in neural network, you know, during training, you usually uh, use dropout for avoiding, avoiding overfitting. So what they do is that during inference, essentially during sampling, they do dropout. Uh, in order to enforce exploration. So, um, so that's, I think, one of the most advanced things I've seen. And it's, you, you can use it in the TF, in the TF agents library. Um, I even played myself and, you know, I created some local simulations where I created my own PyTorch uh, neural network, kind of fun, fun of PyTorch, uh, where essentially what I did is that I created a, fully connected neural network, super simple, I don't know, two, two deaths, uh, two layers. Um, and um, in the last um, layer, you have the different choices for arms, let's say, you know, 10, 20, whatever. And then at the end, what you do is that you can do something, uh, you can use softmax uh, in order to, to, to sample there. Uh, you use Thompson sampling on top of softmax. So um, I think I have a gist on GitHub this one, if I don't, I'll upload it. But uh, yeah, it works on simulation, I don't know if it would work in real world. I assume it needs many more data uh, to be yeah. many more, much more traffic than uh, for the other techniques to converge. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. I would go for the linear one. Uh, even the Amazon paper in the list is a, is a linear model. Um, and yeah, it worked for them. Super. Well, if anyone has a question, um, do ask. Uh, and if not, we can call it a day. What I'm going to do is I'm going to um, stop the recording and upload the video maybe in, in a week or two. So. Uh, you will have the opportunity to see the slides and the talk again. If you have any other things you want to tell us, uh, of course, we have the Slack channel that Chris shared. Um, and hopefully, we'll see you in the next, um, in the next meetup we do. Uh, thank you very much, Pavlos. Thanks, everyone. See you. Uh, in the thank next you. One. See ya. Bye-bye.